We are almost 1k subscribers, so please subscribe for next part. Tiger and Crane episode 25 begins, where Kainyu State's Imperial Hall is filled with musicians and dancers for the celebration. No one knows that among the veiled dancers, Husey and Brick have also adopted the disguise of a dancer, aiming to capture the demon. At the same time, Brick's guard and Zintong blend into the audience to witness the coming thief. Suddenly, the demon comes as a bird, and without delaying for a moment, Husey pulls the string, throwing the cage on the floor. It encloses the demon inside, which pleases the Imperial Preceptor, too. Now that the reason for the Kainyu State's misery has ended, the Imperial Preceptor asks each one of them about their plans. Husey has no intention of staying here as the demon has been eliminated, and Supreme Power is not here either, so they would prefer to stay in Fulong State to participate in its affairs. But Brick does not want to stay any longer, as he has never received any welcoming behavior toward him from his father. Hence, he will prefer to go rather than stay and annoy his father. The Imperial Preceptor stops Brick once more and asks him to revisit his decision to leave the state so soon. But Brick is adamant about his departure and promises to return to save the Kainyu State's people anytime they need him. At the same time, King arrives to seek confirmation about his departure. He knows that his son likes to live freely. Hence, the king wishes his son excellent luck instead of restricting him from the state, and advises Brick to be nice to his friends. As always, he asks the guard to accompany Brick and apologize to Brick for all the times he has been harsh to him. Overflowing with emotions, the king could only pat his son on the back. It brings tears to his friend's eyes, but Husey knows that despite loving his father immensely, Brick can't express it in front of him. They leave the palace while Brick watches his father smile after ages, which means a lot to him. But despite what they talk about, Zintong is immersed in deep thoughts, which she finally expresses. When the guard was killed, the Imperial Preceptor reached the crime location swiftly. Moreover, there was always a strange smell when they left the palace. Thus, they suspect there is something wrong with an Imperial Preceptor. Now that the demon annoying them has been eliminated, the Imperial Preceptor hides something. The more suspicious incident is that the balsamic thief always attacks and collects fancy possessions. But when they saw an ordinary guard dead, he was not holding any attractive items. Hence, the murderer is not who they eliminated. It's still lurking in the state. Brick senses a danger for his father's life and runs towards the palace. But the demon is already sucking the blood from a victim in the palace. As they move forward to save the victim, who they assume is Brick's father, the Imperial Preceptor gets in their way. He discloses that the victim here is not his father, instead, he is the demon itself. It happened when the king led his army to fight demons. Fighting there, a demon hurts him, and he turns into a bloodthirsty demon each night. Thus, the imperial preceptor provides him with any convicted murderer from prison to feed the king. Only then does the king go back to his original face. The imperial preceptor has been hiding the truth from the public. This angers Brick as king must receive prompt treatment, and hiding the truth would cost his life. The Imperial Preceptor reveals that he has brought many physicians, but no one has any cure. Brick sees his father hiding behind the pillar, with long demonic nails and a transformed appearance. The following day, as his father wakes up, Brick tells him he knows what happened to him and helps him get up. Throughout his childhood, Brick has studied medicine with keen interest. Hence, King has a hope that his son might have some information to cure his disease, which is killing him and endangering other lives too. Besides, each physician who visited the palace to cure him never gave an accurate disease prognosis. Hence, Brick tells the truth that demon poison has spread all over his body, and he won't have much time to survive without his blood. Even then, Brick is resolute to find the cure for his father's terminal illness. Right now, the king wishes to walk with his dear son on the streets of Kainyu State. He repents for all the lives he took, but Brick blames Fairy who released all the dangerous demons from the demon-burning pagoda. King remembers every moment Brick has been away during these years, which embarrasses Brick. But King understands his desire to flee the responsibilities as he was the same at his age. On the other hand, Husey is so anxious that Brick has not returned yet. Brick's guard informs them that King's illness results from demons released by Fairy. Before those demons cause more havoc, they must reach Dianfeng Valley and kill the monsters. Even though Brick's father has turned into a demon like Husey's mother, Husey hopes Brick will save and find a cure at each cost. On the other hand, Brick stops at a shoe shop and buys a very comfortable pair of shoes for his father. His shoes are soaked in rain, and he helps his father change the boots. He calls him dad for the first time since he has grown up. King smiles and feels happy beyond limits. Brick apologizes for his reckless attitude and for not understanding that his father has been demanding. 
he promises never to leave his side and run away from his responsibilities. As they return to the palace, King tells Brick the story of his ancestors, who, 500 years ago, needed a place to settle down. Hence, they met the Kyling Gog, and their ancestors agreed with him. Thus, in return, the god allowed them to expand their territory. But in return, the descendant of the Wang family has to carry the Kyling God's divine consciousness, which is essential for the prosperity of the Kyanyu state but a curse for the carrier. After the Wang ancestor passed away, Kyling God's divine power has been residing inside Brick. That's why Kyling God has bestowed him with the divine healing power. Over the hundreds of years, the Wang family enjoyed wealth and peace with the blessing of Kyling God. Dad wants Brick to enjoy his carefree life but keeps in mind that this country must prosper again. Suddenly, his hands begin trembling, and he seeks solitude, but Brick begins searching for the remedy for Dad's ailment in all the books. On the other hand, the king does not accept any person's blood as his prey on this specific night. His hands start shivering because if he doesn't suck human blood, he will die. At the same time, Brick discovers that the only way to save his father is to offer his blood for his father. After sucking all his blood, his dad will live while he can't survive. Brick wants to rush, but Husey and the guards stop him from using the suicidal remedy as they are willing to discover any other way. Simultaneously, the Imperial Preceptor informs us that the king has died. Like a little child, Brick rushes to see his father in disbelief. He sits at his bedside and cries about the unexpected death of his father. The whole state is mourning their king's death. On the other hand, Grandmother is pleased by Zai Oxuan's replenishment strength. The eldest master has indeed sacrificed but the eternal body is free of fatigue. Still, Xiaoxuan has to sharpen his moves to prepare for actual combats. Mu has a unique thousand thread skill that adds speed to anyone's moves. He extends his hands and grants that power to Xiaoxuan. Now, when he thinks of a move, he can visualize the necessary speed it requires. On the other hand, the Kyanyu state is in chaos. Most people in administrative posts in the state have no confidence in the new Wang family's king. They rapidly leave the capital and the Imperial Preceptor denies him from stopping them. The next day, when Zintong and Husey join him, they are so impressed to see Brick immersed in work. But Brick shares that it's not working. Instead, he is looking at the resignation of the state's people. Already worried, Bick asks the Imperial Preceptor what he has brought in. Another pile of resignations reveals that no one is ready to trust their new king, and they are quickly leaving. Husey wants to know what Brick has in mind about the future. Knowing he is not a trusted king, Brick wants to leave Kyanyu and return to Fulong. But the Imperial Preceptor stops him as he learns that the legend of the Kyling God is accurate, and that Brick is the vessel for the divine consciousness of the Kyling God. Once he surrenders himself for the prosperity of the people of his state before Kyling God, he will snatch his life in return for the state's prosperity. As soon as the Imperial Preceptor knows he can save the state, he urges Brick to do it immediately. But Husey doesn't want Brick to give his life for a god. Moreover, all these friends have arrived in the state for the divine power of the Kyling God to prevent the overflowing legendary sea from destroying three states. Now, Imperial Preceptors persuade them that it is time to call Kyling God to rule the state. Even if it costs Brick's life, the Imperial Preceptor persuades Brick to show a miracle to the people so that they keep believing in the King and Wang family's power. Not agreeing with what the Imperial Preceptor says, Brick wants to only leave the state and hand over all the affairs in his hand. But the Imperial Preceptor begs that he is an ordinary man and doesn't find himself suitable for this heavy burden. As the Imperial Preceptor leaves, Husey and Zintong convince Brick to escape. As ancient astrological beliefs, an unseen god will take his life for no reason. Rick shares that whatever the Imperial Preceptor said was for the benefit of his people, but he wants to flee and not become a part of any ceremony. They silently leave the palace before anyone finds them. On their way, they meet guard Zio, who hears them and decides to be on Brick's side. He tells them to swiftly leave the city gates as he will stop men sent by the Imperial Preceptor from reaching them. But the guards stop them at the city gate. They are wearing shiny armor and are ready to tackle any resistance. At the same time, the Imperial Preceptor arrives and gets on his knees to beg Brick. He becomes part of the ceremony to call Kyling God and save their country. Seeing no other way to escape, Brick agrees helplessly. But he keeps only one condition, they release his friends. The Imperial Preceptor promises to let them go after two days as they will hold the ceremony tomorrow because astrologers told them that it was an auspicious time to do the ritual. Then he gets closer to Brick and scolds him for attempting to flee the country. While the whole state is still mourning their king's death, he tells Brick that he was never a good son and never be a great king for his people. That night, Brick was drunk when the Imperial Preceptor visited him. 
He was motivated by the fact that his father would be so proud of him if he did something for their country. But Brick laughs and believes it's only sarcasm. The Imperial Preceptor informs that their people are dying of famine and chaos is everywhere. So, he must prepare himself to devote himself to the meaningful ceremony. Brick tells him with utter disappointment that he doesn't need to know what's happening in the country. Everything the Imperial Preceptor tells him is only to prepare him to participate in the ceremony happily. The Imperial Preceptor goes on to be convinced that his sacrifice will bring immense happiness to their people. The Imperial Preceptor seems to see nothing beyond their people and country's benefit. And Brick is just a vessel, nothing more than that. The following day, they bring Brick to an open ground where the Imperial Preceptor announces that their late Emperor worked tirelessly to bring prosperity to the country for years. Now, their new king has made a sage decision in the favor of their people, namely that he will sacrifice his life. That will release Kyling God from his body, and people will see that Kyling God descend into the mortal world to spread good in their country. Brick keeps hearing the speech with sheer sadness and no motivation in himself. He prays for the king to remain in the memories of everybody forever and bows before him. Brick tells him to finish the drama quickly, but the Imperial Preceptor, who was very motivated for the ceremony, reminded him of all the times he had taught Brick about reading and writing. The five virtues state that people's well-being should be put ahead of the Emperor's. But Brick is too angry that the Imperial Preceptor has forgotten the relationship between the ruler and the subject. The Imperial Preceptor tells him that people always come first, and that everything will be great again once he sacrifices his life. But Brick wants him to think for once about what they will do if nothing changes, even after Brick gives his life, too. The Imperial Preceptor was brought by Brick's father to work in the palace, and he has always been loyal to the people and country. He assures Brick that if he loses his life, then he will die along with him, too. Brick begs him one last time that he only wishes to spend his life as he pleases. But this time, the Imperial Preceptor gets so furious that he asks the guards to tie him to the lighting pillar they brought down specifically to carry to the ceremony. On the other hand, Husey is locked up with Sintong and Zio. From the beginning, he doubts the Imperial Preceptor's intentions that he might want only to kill their friend. But Zintong wants them to think of something to escape jail and save their friend. Zio has been in a prestigious position in the country all along. He believes that Brick's attempt to flee the country three days after his father's death was an immature move. His friends must talk to him and tell him to act wisely like a king, as he is too impulsive. Zio asks a passing guard about the situation outside. As soon as he tells him that the ancestral pillar is out and they are about to carry out the ceremony, he wants Husey and Zintong to do something quickly because they have little time left. Husey looks around and finds nothing to break the lock. He wants to grab Zintong's hairpin to unlock the door, but she gets irritated and does not understand why Husey is touching her hair. In the meantime, Zio unlocks the lock using magic and runs out. Husey wondered why he was always locked as if he could have done it before. The Imperial Preceptor has tied Brick to the lightning pillar. Brick feels humiliated and begs him to untie his hands as people laugh at him. But Imperial Preceptors do not care about public opinion, and they only focus that once the Kyling God is released, they will be eternally remembered as the ones who sacrifice their lives. Suddenly, Zintong and Husey jump on the ground and stand before Brick with their swords. They challenge the Imperial Preceptor to stop this sense, but he orders the guards to kill both if they hinder the ceremony. At the same time, Zio jumps to the ground and becomes a shield to protect Brick. The Imperial Preceptor is surprised that Zio has also become a traitor. Husey tells the Imperial Preceptor to rethink before sacrificing the king's life, who is happy to take a mortal person's body in return for their prosperity, which is also only a hope. Moreover, the Imperial Preceptor's self-righteousness is ruining a life here, and he has no idea. Husey challenges him by saying that the Imperial Preceptor has to kill him first before reaching out to Brick to kill him. Knowing that his friend would not flinch from his claim, he asks Husey to leave him here and run away. But at the same time, a dark cloud spreads in the sky, a sign that Kyling God is arriving. Husey immediately puts his spear on the Imperial Preceptor's neck to stop the ceremony. Still, knowing that the process can't be reverted, the Imperial Preceptor asks him to kill him if it pleases them. Brick shouts at him to flee, but simultaneously, a sharp lightning bolt falls on Brick, and he gets unconscious. A golden ball emerges from his body, shaped like a Kyling Gog. The ritual is complete as the god is released, and everyone on the ground bows before the god. With tears in her eyes, Zintong gets on her knees and begs Kyling God to save Brick's life. Suddenly, Kyling Gid puts everyone to sleep, and only Husey remains awake. That surprises God, but Husey questions why a god needs an innocent to bring prosperity to a town. Why can't he do it on his own? 
Hakuzi challenges God that if he does not bring his friend back, he will kill God if he has to. That angers God as he has never seen someone so unafraid. Hakuzi reveals his belief that any human can conquer nature and doesn't need a god to do anything for him. Angry killing God injures Husey by pushing him behind by hardly moving his fingers. Husey's mouth bleeds, and he gets up again to fight God using his furba. He gets so surprised to see the furba has activated that it amazes Kyling God, too. But despite fighting with a person who has activated Furba, Kyling God puts Husey to sleep and returns to Brick's consciousness. Brick opens his eyes in a dream, alone in a desert. A while later, his tired-looking father walks past him and does not respond to his voice. Then, a herd of people, including his friends, pass by, and they do not listen to him. Suddenly, Brick falls into another plane with fancy glittering lights everywhere. The Kyling God appears in a very young face, and initially, Brick fails to recognize that it's the one who has been residing in his body all his life. He says that glittering stars are the desires and wishes of the people who pray to him. He is not interested in their prayers as it seems they are worshipping their wishes instead of a god. Brick wants to know why he chose Wang's family to be a vessel of his consciousness. Kyling God tells the ancient story that he made a contract to the elders of the Wang family that he would help them extend the land. He chose a person from this family to cultivate his self-consciousness. They started thinking that God was responsible for prosperity, and God never intervened all those years. He just observed their foolishness from the river of time. However, the fact is that their people's hard work has brought the Kyanyu state prosperity. Kyling God never moved a finger to play a role in anything. That angers Brick, he challenges the contract and wants it terminated. Kyling God immediately shows him the contract and incinerates it before his eyes. Brick wants to know what he will say to his people who believe in Kyling God's power to fulfill their wishes. But Kyling God turns Brick into a giant dragon by his power and asks him to solve his dilemma independently. At the same time, Brick opens his eyes to the real world. He opens his tied hands and immediately goes to Husey to wake him from a deep sleep. Husey could not believe that his friend was alive, and he hugged him so tightly that it suffocated Brick. Brick thanks him for fighting with a god for him, but since god injured him in the fight, Brick removes the magical brick to cure Husey's wounds. He bangs the brick on his head, but it only hurts Husey. It turns out that killing god also granted the healing power of Brick, and he took it away, too, when their contract terminated. At the same time, the other people slowly start waking up and sharing that they watch Kyling God in their dreams. He told each one of them that all the prosperity was the result of the hard work of the people of Kyanyu State. Imperial Preceptor also saw the same dream and apologizes to Brick for his foolish beliefs. He repents a lot for his grave mistake that was about to kill their king. He gets on his knees to beg Brick that he can take his life. But Brick believes that the Imperial Preceptor has unparalleled loyalty to Wang's family and forgives him immediately for his mistake. He wants an Imperial Preceptor to help reinstate the glory of the Kyanyu state. As a king, he requested the people to unite to work hard and defeat famine. They pledge their alliance to the king, which they believe. Husey reveals to his friends that Furba has finally activated and that the myth about Kyling God is faithful. After all, Kyling God thinks about the people. Now, Brick has decided to leave Kyanyu. Even though he needs to rebuild the state, he is lying in the overflowing four other states if he cannot. On his departure, he meets the if he is lying the overflowing legendary sea imperial preceptor, who appoints him as the caretaker of the country in his absence. Despite all the loyalty, the imperial preceptor hesitated and cried to refuse the heavy burden of responsibility. But knowing that Brick has to leave for a better cause, he assures that he will protect the country. At the same time, Zio joins him with his elite force. On the other hand, the older master senses a screeching pain in his chest. He opens his shirt, and it's burning like a vessel. At the same time, Xiaoxuan comes into his room and informs him with immense happiness that his body has regained its old strength. The older master drinks the water and coughs like a very sick person. He wants Xiaoxuan to walk along with him outside. Xiaoxuan grabs his hand to walk. Heldert Amster is a weapon that his ancestors created almost 500 years ago. Even though he was a weapon, his life would come to an end one day. Now that he has given his mortal body to Xiaoxuan to save his primordial spirit, his time of death has approached. Xiaoxuan did not know that the eldest master saved his life by sacrificing his own life. His hands are looking rot, and it seems the eldest master won't survive any longer. The eldest master is happy that he has given his life to a worthy man. If Xiaoxuan had spent his life serving others, then the sacrifice of the Eldest Master wouldn't have been futile. The Eldest Master leans forward on the cliff and cries, remembering the days when Xiaoxuan was a little child. 
He watched him sit by the window to enjoy his calligraphy for hours. The eldest master turned into a weapon before Zai Oxuan's eyes, and he could not save it. Taking that weapon in his hands, Zai Oxuan remembers all the great times he and his friends spent with his eldest master. He returns to the palace and pays tribute to the eldest master, who has protected his family for 500 years. Zai Oxuan bowed before his memorial and promised to always remember his teachings. On the other hand, Husey had diarrhea and is taking longer than usual to return to their companions. Hence, they all wait for him when a group of fighters attack them. A masked man who looks like their leader fights with Zintong and she tries to snatch his mask and see his face. With the edge of the spear, she reveals the man's face when a girl from his gang strikes a weapon to her head, and she falls unconscious. They all throw a dust storm toward Brick and his companions and disappear, taking Zintong. Those men belong to the barbarian Julin state. The veiled man is their chief, Damon. On his return, Husey discovers about the combat and wants to follow the fighters of Julin state quickly. Damon brings Zintong to his room while she is still unconscious. He orders the women to get ready as Zintong wakes up quickly. Zintong tries to flee after waking up, but the lady guard puts a sword on her neck. On the other hand, Husey can't wait for another moment to go and resume Zintong from the barbaric Julin tribe. However, Kainu state has conflicted with them for years, and they know these men are mighty. Hence, they can't attack them directly, and they would have to wait till dark to launch an attack for a sure victory. At the same time, Zintong asks the lady guard to use her hands as she has to use the washroom. But instead of letting her do this, the lady guard brings her a bucket. Zintong kicks it away and insists on going to the washroom. She is dressed in red clothes and is about to marry Damon. The ceremony will take place in a few moments. Damon comes into the room and listens to Zintong's furious talk. He is already in awe of her bravery and orders the lady guard to do as Zintong says. They want to wait until dark because the Julin state people may look strong but their night vision could be better, so they would have a better chance of rescuing Zintong successfully. At the same time, Zintong is brought in front of Dameron in his room, where she praises him for being a very caring and impressive leader. She is pleased with their hospitality and has changed her opinion about the Julian clan. Damon feels too happy to hear all the praise. Zintong continues as she shares that all her life, she learned to kill demons. But at last, it would be best to settle down and become a chief's wife and spend the rest of your life in peace. That excites Damon so much that he immediately wants to take her to the ceremony. But Zintong requests him to bring some necessary things before marriage, because it is a ritual of their tribe to drink a specific wine from each other's hands. At the same time, Husey and his friends have taken their position to attack the tribe. Damon brings the wine, but Sintong wants him to untie her hand to complete the ritual. While Zio's brave men enter the city, a fight between the two armies begins. Sintong is eyeing the big axe behind Damon and wants to snatch one to save herself once Damon unties her hand. She does so, and when Damon puts his hand forward to offer her wine, she attacks it and quickly grabs the weapon. Suddenly, the guards outside arrest her. Zintong confesses at this moment that she can't marry or love him, but Damon orders them to keep an eye on her and leaves the room. Amid the fight, Husey and his companions separate from the rest of the fighters to reach the camp. Suddenly, many men stop their advances and say they can't do anything to save their girl. As their chief has already married her, she'd probably be in his bed now. Husey is infuriate infuriated and reaches Chief Damon without delaying any more time. But as Damon grabs his machete to attack him, Husey takes out his furba. Machete shakes lightly, but Brick takes Husey and escapes before they fight. On the other hand, Zintong lies on the bed with her hand tied. She learns that the guard assumes she is a person from Kyanyu State, while she is actually from Fulung State. Zintong notices that the lady guard loves Damon but has not expressed it. She keeps her engaged in talks while trying to untie her hands. According to the ritual, whenever a girl takes out the mask of a fighter of the Julin tribe, she has to marry that man. Meanwhile, Zintong untied her hands and attacked the lady guard. Fusi and Brick silently look at the fighters of Julin tribes celebrating the victory by drinking. Then, they engage in wrestling and have no eye for their surrounding. Hence, they escape while Damon finds Lady Guard lying on the bed with tied hands while Zintong is missing. On the other hand, Damon's brother stops Brick from roaming the streets, looking like Julan's man wearing a mask. He suspects that it's an outside and removes the mask. At the same time, the rest of the people join them, and Brick tries to remind him that he is the one who met him at Kyanyu Gates. They were imprisoned together. Now he remembers, but he can't let go of the grudge that the people of Kyanyu State expelled them. Hence, they are living in rubble like barbarians. Damon's brother is taking Brick along to offer him a drink in exchange for the favor he received in prison from him. But on their way, they meet Zintong, 
taking Damon with her by putting a sword on his neck. She asks them to let go of Brick. Damon approves of her wishes, and suddenly, a pillar from the camp is about to fall on Zintong. But Damon takes a swift turn and prevents it from falling on her. But in that attempt, he injures his hand badly. Once again, Zintong is unarmed. Damon returns to his camp and asks his guard to bring Zintong. 2. The lady guard puts a swab on Damon's wound, which hurts him badly. She offers to put on a bandage, and Damon allows her. He is so devastated that a girl he brought along is not ready to marry him despite being a chief. Zintong wants to know why they are living as bandits here. Damon shares that when the legendary sea overflowed, every rich and poor became homeless as it flooded the entire Julan state. In this situation, Kayanyu refused to take them as refugees, too. Zintong assured him that Kayanyu's state was also suffering. But even then, Damon can't see his clan suffering when they need shelter. At the same time, Xiaoxuan joins them as he receives a signal. But Husey shares the situation in which the chief takes away Zintong to make his bride, while Brick is under arrest. On the other hand, Zintong shares that she loves someone else, so they can't become husband and wife. But he can accept her as his sister to complete the tribe's ritual. She introduces herself as the sorcerer from Fulong State and their chief commander. Damon is so impressed to know that she is the one who saved the sorcerers when the capital is under attack by demons. She shares her plan that they want to cut the source of the legendary sea. Because just like it destroyed the Julan state, it will also ruin the rest of the area. So they want to cut the source from the root by going to Dianfeng Valley. Damon assures her that Julan state will stand by their side in this challenging situation. He brings a drink for Zintong and swears that he will be her brother from now on. They celebrate this in the camp where the marriage is supposed to occur. Husey hears the music from outside and thinks that Chief Han's already married Zintong. But someone else is appointed to guard the camp, which is weird. They enter the camp and are about to attack when Zintong stops them and discloses that she and Damon have become sword brothers and sisters. Husey could not believe it and was so annoyed by her new bond. He suspects the chief is still faking his intention and wants to marry Zintong. But Damon gets up from the dinner table and apologizes for attacking them. They are settled here because they have no choice but to go after Kainyu's state's refusal. Zintong assures to help as Julan state is a victim. Brick apologized to Julan state as king of his country and assured them they were also in crisis when denied help. Now that they are together, Damon wants to enjoy the night by singing and dancing. Even now, Husey is not satisfied with Damon's intentions, but he laughs and offers him to arm wrestle with him. Initially, Damon is winning, but when Husey senses it's almost his victory, Husey grabs his furba and wins the wrestling. At the same time, Dame's matched moves. The following day, Brick looks at how miserable the Julan tribe is. He wants to do something. Meanwhile, Damon looks at Furba. Each time, he takes out Furba and match moves. They are both made from demon bones and are too powerful, but gets annoyed by his frankness with him and Zintong. So Damon guesses that he is the one Zintong loves. Before their departure, Brick writes a letter to the Imperial Preceptor to allow refugees from the Julan state into the Kyanium. It strengthens their bonds, and when Damon is about to hug them to say goodbye, Husey comes forward to save her from touching him. They are all assured of gathering another time when everything will be fine. Legendary Sea's formation is about to break. While returning, Husey discovers that his elder master had died, and he cried a lot sitting at his memorial. He believes in finding a solution to bring him back once they reach Dianfeng Valley. He may is the real culprit for everything. They return to the Legendary Sea formation where Husey splits the legendary sea using his furba. But Grandma shares that the sea will remain split for only half an hour, and they need a very speedy vehicle to get them to the Dianfeng Valley. Any ordinary ship will burn in the sea's fire, while they have an ancient vehicle, but its speed needs to be higher even if they try speeding it up using magic. A few days later, they find a strange vehicle parked in front of the palace. No man or animal is pushing it. Suddenly, Damon comes out of it and offers the vehicle to reach Dianfeng Valley. They meet their friend, who is a royal sorcerer now. The vehicle looks small but can carry 100 people, its ancestors built it. The hull of the legendary sea is integrated into it, and it can help them cross the legendary sea. But if they have to cross the sea quickly, they need to move it swiftly. Hence, Damon offers to change its power system, and they also need the bow from the legendary ship buried in the ruins. The people of Julan State are very talented. Damon also needs a few red pearls to speed things up which Brick offers, but Husey is not happy with his arrival. Julan tribe has a big appetite. While on the go towards formation, they stop to eat. Zio gets so angry that the Julan tribe does not care what others eat. They want a lot of food for themselves. He gets so angry and taunts Damon's brother for being a barbarian. 
both tribes have never gotten along so well and, once again, stand against each other. On the other hand, Xi Oxuan searches for the ruins of the legendary ship and soon finds the buried bow. Brick and Zintong stop both tribes from fighting and don't see any way to stop the fight in the future. Before reaching Dianfeng Valley, they must solve their conflicts and fight united. A while later, the Julin tribe separated each part of the vehicle as instructed by Damon and his brother Na Drake with help from the Kyanyu tribe. Zio does not obey the order when asked to correct the mistake. By working tirelessly, they successfully changed the vehicle, and Damon shared that it could carry 100 people across the sea because it is made of the rune from the Xuan Wang universe formation. Julin tribe has this formation, which another tribe thinks was lost centuries ago. From inside, the vehicle is a whole other universe. Initially, Zio taunted Damon's brother to do something to earn their respect. Now he asked him to be respectful as they modified the vehicle from their skill as promised. Before starting their journey, they sit at the dinner table for dinner. Once again, Zio and Damon's brother put their fork on the same dish and compete to take it first. In this attempt, they break the table and destroy the food. Watching their conflicts, they know their grudges won't end in a day, as it will take time. At the same time, Grandma joins them and suggests making a commander-in-chief who is not from any two tribes. She suggests that Zintong be their commander as she is very talented. And everyone, including Brick and Damon, shows their trust in her. She worries about taking this responsibility, but everyone assures her to help. Now, they must select 100 warriors as they will fight many demons in Dianfeng Valley. But the vehicle can only carry 100. Zintong asks the warriors to volunteer for a fight, which is far too tricky, and they might now return. Hence, everyone with a family can stay behind. The process of enrollment starts, and they give a tag to each warrior, and Brick writes the names down. As usual, Damon's brother and Zio fight for their names to be written first. Brick solves the conflict by writing both names simultaneously. Grandma is happy that both tribes are sorting out their conflicts, but she turns to Roman 11 AOXUAN and asks him to promise that he will fight wholeheartedly in Dianfeng Valley to take back his body from Brother Yan. Xiaoxuan promises and sister Yanren appears at the entrance. The people of Julin State have long and complicated names. Writing them down and pronouncing them is tough. The next in line is Commander Wu. They never expected him, but he wants to be part of the army, silently and mysteriously gets his tag, and goes away. The long line of participants ends, and in the end, they see Cheng wanting to be in the army. They have fought with Cheng on many fronts and know he could be a better suited participant but Cheng assures that he has learned a lesson after his father is incarcerated. Now, he has to show his worth by bringing back his father. They give him the last tag and believe that he has changed. They plan to hold a farewell banquet for everyone, and Zintong takes Huzi to the market to get the groceries. When one of the vendors finds that Zintong is their commander, he offers all the vegetables for free. Seeing him, all the other vendors give them free vegetables. But Zintong politely refuses that if a commander gets a free thing from an ordinary person, it will set a bad example in the army. She thanks them for their sincerity. On the other hand, Brick tries to catch a cock to bring in the kitchen to cook for the banquet. He fails, and Damon's brother arrives at the scene with Zio. He challenges him so that he can catch more hens, and they start a competition. On the other hand, Yanren makes her way into the kitchen by hiding. She hides her face when Zintong and Huzi return from the market. Just as Huzi is about to see her face, Zintong calls him back. That night, Zintong addressed the warriors as solid and united in the fight. They once lost to the legendary sea, but now, they must block their way at all costs for their survival. That is the only way for their survival and prosperity. They all promise to drink together that night. A dance begins around the fire while Huzi pours wine for Damon. That night, Zio and Damon's brother drink together, and Zio tells him that he respects him now. From now on, they are brothers. Zintong watches Wu sitting alone and drinking with him. Their tribes had conflicts in the past, but she wants him to be her comrade in the fight by forgetting the past conflicts. Mu has no purpose in life left since he may killed Mayo Miao. She was the love of his life, and he promised to kill her in Dianfeng Valley. Yanren hits a soldier and steals his tag. Cheng accidentally hits the mask of the lady guard, which angers her a lot. Everyone is drunk and singing and enjoying. Later that night, Xiaoxuan, Zintong, Huzi, and Brick sit together like old times. They watch the stars, and suddenly, Brick feels nausea, and Xiaoxuan takes him aside. That leaves Huzi and Zintong alone. He tells her that he wants to say something. As usual, Huzi takes a little time to utter words. Knowing that Huzi wants to express his love for her, she tells him she will listen after their return from Dianfeng Valley. 
Everyone, including Yanren, gets in the vehicle. Hyuzi gets on the top of the vehicle with Sai Oxuan as he has to split the sea using activated Furba. The sea splits while Sorcerer's strengthens the vehicle's power to go faster. The vehicle starts, and it is going at great speed. They travel for six hours, but it will take them half a day to reach Diangfeng Valley. Suddenly, the power stops in the vehicle. The delay will cost them their time as the legendary sea is closing again. Damon wants to go and check the red pearls outside the vehicle inserted in the back, but it can cost him his life. His brother volunteers to go as he only knows the exact location. Sayo goes along with him and successfully inserts another red pearl. Even then, the speed did not work, and now Zayo uses the magic of spirit essence to speed it up. But the magic takes time to start, and the legendary sea is closing at a dangerous speed. Like this video and please subscribers for next part.